lectures. We are, we are really fortunate to have Paul Monahan with us here today. Um, uh, you, you know probably that he's a director, founding director of AHMM, and um, he's going to talk to us um, about uh, AHMM's unique uh, approach to design um, and and how they go about it, and and probably how they're adjusting um, to recent events and 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 um, working still um, as usual, but maybe not in the office. Um, at, the, at this moment in time. So, um, well, Paul is actually a son of Liverpool, so so it's great um, to, to have him back virtually. Um, he, he went to St Edward's College um, and, and grew up from, in West Derby. Um, he's, um, you, you probably know, he's building the Unity Building, that's uh, 2017, I think, no, 2007. Um, he's also done work on the Royal College, uh, at, the, at the Royal Court, um, and he's working on um, uh, Alderhey Bereavement Centre. AHM, AHMM, his practice is national and international. It employs over 500 employees. Um, and um, in this month's um, AJ uh, was one of the most respected um, practices um, uh, by respondents uh, alongside Norman Foster um, or Foster Associates. So, and partners. Um, so, as I say, we are very privileged to have Paul. And without further ado, I'll, I'll pass you over to him. Um, we, he is available for some questions at the end. It should should be about half an hour. Um, so, if you send those through, um, maybe in chat form or, or whatever, um, then we'll we'll attempt to answer some of those uh, with him. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. And um, hi, everyone. I think Sadia is going to press the um, play button. Um, good to be here. Nice to. I'm in North London, but you're all um, spread around my home city, so it's great to to be here. And um, I think it's quite a long time since I've done a talk to the university. Um, so um, I think what I'm going to try and do today is in a way this is quite this could work quite well for those of you who are in. I think you're all in third year. Is that right? Um, um, it's it's really a primer for for how we design buildings in the office. Um, I'm quite often asked when people join the firm, you know, what it is about HMM, what we do, how do we work it, how do we develop designs, um, what is it about our work that's slightly different. And I suppose this is trying to be quite literal. It's um, has its moments of being deeper than other bits, but it's quite literal. And I, I I'd really like to take you through it and see what you think. Feel free to send some chats during the talk, I'll either catch, any, catch my eye. And don't always ask questions, I'm happy with comments as well. Like that looks like a lovely building or, or don't think much of that one. Happy with all of that. This is um, uh, quite um, lightweighted in terms of um, its spirit, um, but serious in terms of its nature. Next, please. This year we celebrated our 30th year in practice and um, what well, we decided that the, the four of us who founded it, may, maybe it was time, we're a very big firm now, that we we set out what we call the founder's statement, <clears throat> which might be something when we're long gone that maybe continues, but really trying to understand why we got together and what we do. And effectively, what we realized is that our, our practice is based on three things. It's based on our love of architecture and commitment to architecture. It's based on our alliance, that's the four of us, and the alliance of the 550 people who work for us, and particularly some of those people who've been with us an awful long time. Some of them have actually been with the firm for 27 years for our 30. So it's about those alliances. And then it's also about allowances and collaborations with um, other firms, such as engineers and artists, etc. So, And finally, I think, um, just letting someone in the lobby. Um, finally, it's about ambition. We've always been ambitious. It's slightly irritating, to be honest with you, because we always think, um, can we do any better? So I thought when we won the Sterling Prize, is that good enough? And it's like, no, we've got to keep going and carry on being ambitious. So it sort of has always been a driving thing that the four of us drive each other on, and then the people in the practice drive us on too. So how we don't, how we keep a firm, I suppose from our point of view, 
how do we create work that is as important as the small, more boutique firms? How do you do it at a big scale? There aren't many people like us. I'd say there's only, I'm talking about the scale we're at, there's only really, I think, Fosters who people really admire who work at scale and um, do consistently good work. And really people like Rogers, who I admire greatly, uh, Roger Sturk Harbour are much, much smaller than us. So it's sort of how do we do that? And how do we keep the standards of that work to a high level? So if we go to the next one, so um, which is sort of us. So in a way, this is more for you. So that's us, the four of us joining the Bartlett. Simon and I went to Sheffield together. So from 1980, um, we decided to go to the Bartlett. Pete and John went to Bristol and they closed the school down. So they joined the Bartlett. We were the only four outsiders then. The Bartlett now has 130 intake in each year. For, for diploma and pre-diploma, but there were only four of us at that point. Um, and I suppose that's when we, because we're the only outsiders, we became friends quite quickly. And by the end of the first year, we decided to start working together and um, we started to do some competitions. And then we joined a big firm called BDP, who are the biggest, the second biggest firm um, in the country and joined them for three years before we set up in practice in 1989 and um, with with almost no view about how we might take on practice. So suppose what this photograph is trying to show, um, and you can see how the years have affected me, but um, that youthful and slightly skinny person on the left, we once were like you, and it doesn't feel like that long ago. I know 30 years is a long time, but we were like you with great ambitions to either join a firm and be important in that firm, or join our own firm, or and do architecture of some significance. Next. But now, in terms of our practice, it's very different. There's there's us in my flat in Swiss Cottage doing our diploma project um, in the summer of '86, and you know it's obviously a good backstory that we've stayed together that long. There's not many firms to have, and there's not many firms of four people who are so solid. And obviously, we have great friendship and we have great uh, drive within us and there's something about the four of us that were I think we're greater than the the equal parts that we are we're greater than that and that's something special but equally now on the right is like one of our parties a while ago goodness knows where we'll be able to have another one we've had to cancel one this year but um, um, how does that translate to a massive firm how do we how do we keep a consistency in architecture without turning into a firm where everything we do, if you like, is, is led by some younger director and does what they feel like? And that's not what we're interested in. So if we go to the next one. Um, yeah, so what I've tried to do is break down the way we work into some detail to be quite specific. So if we go to the next one to begin with, bespoke. So what um and flick on to the next one as well so i think um i think one so i i say our greatest strength is that every building we do is slightly different and it's also our greatest weakness because the architects a lot of you admire i i'm thinking you know because what i tend to find out of architecture college that 95 percent of architects want to be david chifferfield but if you take someone like David, who taught us actually years ago, um, has an incredibly consistent, how style is too pejorative, has a very consistent manner. We don't. We have a consistent way of thinking. In terms of our greatest strength, why is our greatest strength that a lot of our buildings are very different? I'll tell you why, because clients love the bespoke. They love to think that the building we're designing for them is unique to them and that we wouldn't do it for someone else. And that is a very, very powerful tool when you run a big practice. It's also bloody difficult because just when you find a successful way of doing something, you can't always reuse it. You have to hide the fact you're reusing it. So <clears throat> these are just some examples that show that range. So both of these are office building. One, the white collar factory, a sort of eco building, and the building on the right, another eco building, but made completely out of prefabricated brickwork. Next. We like the big typology, so we do a lot of schools. So that's Chobham Manor, which is in the middle of the Olympic Village, and on the right is Dagenham Park School. Same brief, completely different buildings. Next. 
housing, one made out of timber um, panels and off-site, the other off-site using concrete panels. Um, quite different, but you'll start to see there are things that tie it together. Next, there's elements of detail like the balustrades. So I think that's just trying to say, how do we, why do we do that? And what is, you know, is it just that we have a different architect for each one and they feel like doing what they feel like? Well, that's not the case. I think we do have a consistency. But I'm beginning by, I suppose, how we get projects in the first place, which is solving the brief. Next. And quite often that would involve optioneering and these are the sort of drawings that one does to look at, this is for a school, looks at lots of different layouts and then trying to, I suppose, funnel that down to one or two options and one option. Next. We need to move quickly and we need to do drawings that sort of are clear. And we are very good at being clear with drawings and clear on PowerPoints, which is the predominant way we describe our work. So this is a project designed very, very quickly. I'm just using it as an example. It's in Shepherd's Bush. Really clear, the blues office, the pinks, residential and it's just really being clear about a footprint and a ground floor next what is incredibly important to, to me for the younger architects to come in that they can do these things so this is then calculating the amount of office area the net to gross and that is such an important part of it because when we get the areas right and we get enough area because there is almost no project apart from maybe a church where they, these sort of numbers are vital for the viability of project. So this is a key part of technically solving the brief. Next. When you move on from a project, um, you need more things. And this next image, sorry, that's it. this is a three-dimensional version of that. It just shows three versions we've got, the difference in areas, and it makes it really easy for a client to understand it. And he can look at that and say, I actually want option B or option A. And that's, again, clear drawings, clear way of describing things. That's what clients like from us. Next. When it gets to the next level, as you go deeper into the project, there are a huge amount of technical aspects that one needs to do for getting design. So this is from a master plan we're doing in Peckham, where we're doing about nine buildings with different architects. And if you go to the next slide, this is part of the report from it. What we have to do is take that master plan. So this drawing is one of six drawings which look talk about residential amenity, i.e. what are we using for outdoor space, the roofs and the decks and the ground floor. Next, there's another one here that I think is looking at delivery. Now, sunlight. We have to be very specific about the hours of sunlight on March the 31st. And all of the yellow there shows which areas get two hours of sunlight. And that has to occur in some of the projects. So very technical, working with other consultants. Next. And yeah, refuse strategy. I know it sounds boring, but it's quite interesting when you get into it. Cycling, all of these different things are very, very specific and we're bloody good at dealing with these. And that's what a lot of younger architects aren't so good at. And that's what that rigor is so important in the way we work. Next. We also get complex briefs. This is for Kentish Town Health Centre. It's a brief for doctor surgery, a big one. And how do you turn that into architecture? Next. Um, what we used here was the metaphor of Yenga. Next, we did that because when you, we looked at the building, we realised the brief was going to change over time. Planning in flexibility is so important. And the good thing about the, the Yenga, it meant that the building could shift and slide <clears throat> and wasn't one big box which is incredibly important when it comes to um, how you deal with changes in brief, because believe it or not, clients change their mind all the time. And as an architect, you've got to learn not to get frustrated about that. But what you've got to do is create the sort of coat hanger that allows you to change that next. Yeah, and that was also really good when it came to getting planning, because that idea of Yenga broke the massing up. And instead of it feeling like a really big building, next to all these semi-detached houses, it felt like it fitted in because it was it was more appropriate in its massing. So it was, it was one idea that worked on a number of levels. Next. So that's a bit about, um, about some of the problem solving that we need. And there's lots of things that I would expect a younger architect to do.
but I suppose here now we have a, a motto that was was from our earliest days when we first were at the Bartlett, which if it's not drawn, it can't be discussed. So that wasn't trying to dismiss words, but was trying to say that words with drawings are more important and drawings are important. And I thought I'd show you some of the range of drawings that get done in the practice next. And this is, and I'd say ideally, all of you there would be able to get from this first slide to the penultimate slide I'm about to show on this section. So freehand drawings, this is my sketch of Unity that um, I did ages ago. And although it sort of cheats like mad in terms of lots of different bits of it, it got across the idea of a thin tower and a fat tower and a series of terraces and um, how that building worked. So, you know, freehand is still very effective. Next. Um, and then you can take other freehand drawings. Another one I did, actually my first drawing on Morfolio Trace on the computer freehand, but just trying to show that project I showed in the beginning in Shepherd's Bush, just trying to get an idea for the planners that look sketchy. And of course, when it's not drawn on the computer, it looks more tentative. So the planners are more relaxed about it. Next. So be able to do that is good. This is a more refined drawing when the building's more, more uh, I suppose it's more finished, traced over a computer drawing. This is actually by Joe Morris, Mar Morris and Company. Joe, I taught and worked for me for eight years. Um, actually, I, did, you know, I, I think we worked together is the more appropriate way of saying it. And also with Joe, that would be the right way. But, you know, he was a fantastic draftsman. Brilliant. Next. Um, this next drawing, when it comes, um, shows how you can do freehand in section two and how um, you can get life into a section. Sections are also one of the key touchstones of how we work. Next. And then we quite like these drawings, which are tiltograms. This is New Scotland Yard. Why we like these is that they um, people can understand them who aren't architects. Uh, I think a lot of people struggle to read plans and we struggle to understand that. So we do these drawings, which helps communicate it. But often, like this one, they can be a very beautiful drawing too. Next. Real clarity to that one. And I think if we go to the next one, there's some, yeah, this is a stonker. This was Dora, very one of our part two students who um, drew almost the whole city of London. It's Broadgate. We're doing a big building in Broadgate, and it, it's trying to show how that will knit in in the public realm. So these tiltograms show how the public realm relates to the building. Next. So that's a very high level. Not many of you will be able to do that, although most of it's tracing. So the next level is computer. And I always, when I go and do either external examining, critting, always moan that universities don't teach enough about computing. Because on the whole, while you can, if you can freehand, that is brilliant. But our main mechanism is computers. Although there's 550 people, there's 550 computers. There aren't any drawing boards. People can sketch or they use computer and they need to do the computer well. This is an entry level of computer drawings, but shows how effective it can be. Just a very simple it's a competition we're doing actually at the moment where we're just trying to see how this taller building fits into this context near London. Next. Um, and that can be turned into something that's more sophisticated. This is a micro station model. Um, we use Microsation and Revit, and this is when the building is fully designed. And of course, once it's fully designed, it's easy to draw it because it's there and designed. And then you can pull lots of things out. The computer, if you're good at it, so go to the next one, you get better jobs in any office you work in. If you can't use it, you get the more boring jobs. It's as simple as that. So I'm a great advocate because I can't draw on the computer, so I can talk, but I can draw quite well freehand. I never use a drawing board anymore. I only use sketching. But when you can get to this level, this is Vlad in the office. This is Broadgate, where we're making this reception out of cardboard tubes. This sells an idea to a client. It's done quickly. This isn't a two week drawing. This is a one day drawing, one day model. And when you can get to this level, you can pick any project you want to work on in our office. Next. And believe me, there's a lot of people who can. We love drawings like this that are fragments. So this one takes an idea of a, a vertical promenade through a building 
um, with a series of breakout spaces, and it just really explains the guts of the building. Next. And then, you know, then you can start to do these again, Vlad drawing, where you can start to see how you can create atmosphere, lighting, and I've no idea how they're done, but um, they are fantastic drawings and, and really enable us to win great work. Next. And if you get really, really good, you can do a drawing like this, where you don't even know if it's real or false. And this is by Forbes Massey, who are probably the greatest uh, computer artists in London at the moment. Next. So that's drawing. And I think you need to get to, by the end of diploma year, almost all of them, apart from those last two, I think. And if you can't, you're not going to have as much, as much interesting work. I think it's as simple as that. But the computer is your currency when you leave university. While we do train people from the beginning, I'll be really clear, we don't particularly look at people's CVs unless they have some sort of proficiency on one of the key programs that we use. And, and I know that's true of all of our main competitors. So, um, yeah, you've got plenty of time. You've got three years, haven't you, all of you? So that's per perfect. The next thing is about other things that define our practice. So the idea of public realm, next. Um, I think this first project is one of our first big competition wins, Warsaw Bus Station, where there's an idea about this flying saucer roof. It's the bus station. And then we basically raise this big square in front of that church that's the building below. Next. And I suppose public room tends to, you know, whether it be big bits of public realm or small bits, that's the bus station itself next. Or more formal spaces like this square that you can see coming up there that didn't used to be there. That used to be a road where that bench is. And we pushed the road to the left and created this big public space in front of it, which, which works really well now in the heart of Warsaw. Next. This next project is um, Barking, our first big regeneration project. Um, where, where we built six projects, including a new library, and it was worked with Muff Landscape. And we created two new squares, a town hall square in front of the town hall, which is the building on the left, and the Arboretum, where you can see those trees, which is the big, more playful space next. And I suppose those two things, with all the connections around it, were things that made these quite big buildings knit into the, 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 the fabric of Barking. And there's this lovely idea of trees, which are plant, uh, from all around the world that reflect the sort of quite varied demographic of people who live in Barking. Next. And then there were set piece spaces, like the arcade, uh, which is next to the library, where we uh, created this double height arcade. Next. This next project is another project that's more about master planning and public realm, which is Television Centre in uh, White City, Woodlay, where the original headquarters of the BBC, which we've since refurbished. And this is what it was like originally, studios one to eight around the edge, and then other um, drama blocks, which were about making scenery, the restaurant block, where, which is where the Blue Peter Garden used to be, and then lots of other stages, which are the studios. So really, how, we wanted to open all of this up, because instead of studios, we're creating offices, some studios, and a thousand residential units next. So it's quite prescriptive. What we tried to do is turn that back road into a lovely crescent, tree line crescent. And the, red, the, the, the bit in the middle at the front, we tried to create into a series of step terraces rather than a giant car park. So if you look at the next slide, this is one image, you've probably seen it on the Anton Deck show or Good Morning or Loose Women, it's often used there now. And here's this stepped terrace going, to the building where are uh, one of those great things about how you win the job. We win the job by saying, look, we're not going to change what it looks like. So even if our building on the right is brand new, mm. it tried to knit into the architecture of that 1950s architecture. Next. <clears throat> A new project on Finchley Road in North London, Swiss Cottage, where we're connecting two tube stations, West Hampstons and Finchley Road with this giant, long, tree-lined avenue, which is um, something that um, is, is very predominant in that part of London. And you can see it's quite a dense scheme. It's more residential and mixed use next. And I suppose here, there's um, 
there was an idea as you went along there that you would create a series of pocket parks that would have different themes from allotments to olive graves to walled gardens and that that could be quite a hook for the project next rather than just bland landscape we we realized that you know i realized i live near hampstead garden suburb and just realize hampstead garden suburb is amazing those garden so garden cities and garden suburbs because it's not just the architecture, the arts and crafts, it's the landscape. And it's not just about big set piece spaces, it's about small spaces too. Next. And what we realised we could call this scheme um, Hampstead Gardens, which is um, that's a view of it down that avenue at the moment. Still work in progress, but you get the idea. Next. Um, yeah, so that, that was the branding for the project too, because there is no Hampstead Gardens. And probably some of you realise Hampstead is one of the most expensive parts of London, so it adds value to the residential. Next. <clears throat> the other bit we look at is public rooms. So if we go to the next slide, so we'd like to incorporate them wherever we can in projects. So one of our most well-known ones is the Angel Building. It's an office building in London. And I suppose the revolutionary idea, it doesn't sound that revolutionary, is that that cafe is open to the public. Before that, you couldn't get in office buildings. Whereas now almost every office building you create has a cafe in the middle of it. And I suppose that becomes this great big public room that anyone can come into and, and completely changes the nature of the workspace. Next. <coughs> in the middle of the city, there's a much more formal version of that. But again, something very composed. Next. This is a television centre again, where we've got a very dramatic space with these cascading bridges going through the middle of it. And this is a public walkway that anyone can walk through. Next. So it's tying together that public realm. A much quirkier version, this is in the middle of Broadgate, where we're trying to attract younger tenants. And we've got Morig Myerskoff, Studio Myerskoff, to design this mad cafe in the middle as a piece of art with planting above. And gives a central focus to that quite dark and quite simple space. Next. Lots of schools have them. This is Westminster Academy, one of our more well-known schools, where you have this space that when you walk in, there really is um, a feeling of that you've arrived somewhere special. Next. And this is um, our University of Amsterdam. This is a huge um, bar for the Students' Union overlooking at the 10th floor, all the canals of Amsterdam. Next. And then in Parliament at the moment, we're designing the new House of Commons, uh, the temporary House of Commons for when the, um, the government move out of the houses of um, Westminster. And this is the main lobby, um, which will have the House of Commons on the right. And a slightly public room is next, because all of this leads into this space, which is the new House of Commons lobby, which you can see we're designing, relating to what's there at the moment, but making it much better for access, making it much better for visibility, and obviously making it more contemporary in the, the manner it's looked at. Next. OK, so those are things. Let's go to the next slide, Sadi, if you could. Um, this is. Um, our diploma project at the Bartlett next, which was an idea about four buildings in the city and the fifth man was the idea of the public space between them. What we realized, there were two things that we looked at there. The first one, it was, this was our sort of manifesto that it's the field of everyday buildings rather than public buildings that modern architecture failed the city. This was written to again mid eighties. So there wasn't much good new modern architecture then and there's a lot of bad modern architecture. Next. So that's now been rebranded in our firm as the everyday, and we love everyday buildings. We love buildings that are the background of cities as well as um, other parts of the city. And I think if you go to the next slide, we're interested in how we make those everyday ordinary buildings into something extraordinary. And I think that is a really key component. When we grew up and started practice, everyone wanted to do art galleries. But we wanted to do schools, offices, housing, the everyday fabric that ordinary people use. We like doing galleries again as well. Don't get me wrong. We've done the Saatchi Gallery, but we are focused on creating a better urban fabric. Next. The second thing that we looked at was this idea of functional 
the functional program alone is not sufficient to generate an architecture. And we use lots of examples like this one. Lakeshore Drive is apartments. The Seagram building is an office building. They look the same, but they're very flexible the way they're designed. Next, that's been rebranded 30 years later as universal use. And that's what so that we think about. So when we design buildings, we think about how they could be flexible in the future. We don't make them so bespoke in the shape and the format that they are impossible to convert because lots of the buildings we admire have been converted over time. Now, what we found interesting was that we said those two manifesto points 34 years ago, but actually we realized we're still doing that now and they are still the central focus of our practice. So we've been quite consistent in that next. But that's quite general, big level. How do we design? So I'll take a few buildings here. White collar factory um, meant to, how do you create a modern warehouse building, raw building that creative industries would like to use in as a brand new building rather than just taking over warehouse? Next. And this building was created with five points. The idea of higher ceilings. I still don't know an office building that's got such high ceilings, uh, concrete, core cooling that's you can see there's holes in the floor that's water going into it to cool it in the evenings openable windows the idea of planning in flexibility and basically it the building staying cool or warm depending what season we're in none of it sounds like rocket science but again it is and it's sort of highly influential this building now in terms of how one thinks about a much more um, kinder building to the environment next so that was the core principles and there you can see the rawness of it trying to capture some of the things you might find in i suppose um, the more industrial parts of every city next but there was another one which is another idea that we also overlay and this can be overlaid in any building type the idea of the theater the stage set and the props that what we're often designing is just the theater as an office building and the stage set is the partitions and the props are the, are the furniture and if you start to think about those buildings that way, and almost any building type can be taken, it allows you to think about what the key strategic decisions are that you make. So in the white collar, if you go to the next slide, we did end up doing the stage set and the props because we, the, the office group, who are a bit like we work, allowed us to design their partitions, their furniture on their floors that they had. So again, there's the props and there's the theatre, the stage sets next. And then there was another idea in white color. A lot of our buildings have some, several layers. There was a sort of idea that we enjoyed Jean Prouvé. And this is a picture of him with one of his most famous buildings behind. Next, and that's really where, um, if we go to the next slide, that circular motif where the ventilation panels, are, oh, if you go back one side here, sorry. Um, the circular motif for the panels worked. And the green that's in the building, which is even less people know about, is the green that Prouvé used in a chair that he designed in the 1950s that became very popular. So it's small quotes that not everyone would know about. So I suppose what you've seen there is a number of layers to that one project. Next. In Burnwood, the school that we designed in Wandsworth, um, we used IIT by Mies van der Rohe in Chicago as an inspiration that had a long route through the middle with a composition of sliding pavilions across there. Next, and this became our master plan for Burntwood. And there you can see that long route with the buildings across it. And um, we were very fortunate that the school head teacher loved Mies van der Rohe. Um, we were even more fortunate, she even knew who Mies van der Rohe was. So she was with us all the way, and that gave us a lot of impetus to pursue this idea. Next, but we were also working for contractors and really this layout of plan was the only way we could build it while maintaining the buildings on site in full occupation so if you like the green red and blue and yellow buildings couldn't go anywhere else so they were very defined by the procurement of the project too so again i often think when you've got two things coming from a completely different angle and they coincide it means you've got the right concept next Um, more poetic ideas. This we're quite rare using these type of things, but this is a lovely drawing where you just lift up the park in Portsmouth to create this new university building. Next, 
And then what you have is the park vertically growing up the building next. It's a very powerful drawing, a very quick drawing just on the computer. And then, of course, you spend the next two months with thousands and thousands of pounds worth of resource to try and create a CGI that tries to capture the spirit of that initial idea and sketch. Next. Um, this is a different version of a terrace building. This yet yeah, this green is a, basically the idea of daylighting and how daylighting it's, it gives us a sort of what we call a jelly mold because that building is surrounded by flats. And if we if we go outside that green bit, we have to pay a lot of money to the apartments. So this is about rights of light and daylighting and making sure if you build a new building, you don't diminish other people's daylighting. Next. That turned into this building that had a series of terraces all the way up it. You can see there now it makes more sense with the context. Next. And what was great about that? Um, we sold that idea as the Hanging Gardens of Babylon to the client. In a way, it was the step terraces. Next. And when you look at the building from the rear, what you actually see are these huge terraces, which every single floor of that office building, and that off office building is the headquarters of LinkedIn. Every single floor has a terrace, and that planting is a buffer to all the apartments behind, so they can't see in. Next. Um, Another building we've just recently finished is an apartment building. This is of SA in concrete. It was all about concrete and I suppose very fine joinery, two materials, timber and concrete. Next. But it was also about unusual split section apartments. The colours there represent the shape of the apartments. Very unusual and uh, about an idea of volume being as important as plan. Next. And of course, that unusual sectional idea in apartments, which is very hard to do. Sorry, we're struggling to get the next image um, of, of buildings. There we go. OK. Oh, you've gone two again, Sadi, I'm afraid. Go back one. OK, yeah. Um, in the shadow of the Shard in London. So um, again, quite unusual for housing and something that um, we want to explore more of. Next. The the next one is really about um, buildings. We've got an American office in Oklahoma, and this is an um, idea we had 15 years ago, which is taking container bases and turning it into housing. When we did it 15 years ago, it's for the Peabody Trust. It was for refugee housing. This is for quite well to do people in um, Oklahoma and what we've created is two and three bedroom departments and painted the container bases white and it's incredibly quick to build and has been very successful. Next. So that's about how you have an idea based on making. Television Centre was really about an idea about how you take this, this as I've already mentioned, this, this 1950s architecture and create a building where you don't know if you're in the new bit or the old bit. Next. So if you look at the original image of the reception, this is where all the stars used to come in. It's called the stage door. If you go now, you can't really tell in our new image if that's from 1950, no, 1962 or from last week. Um, hopefully it's very complimentary. So sometimes it's good to be quite background in your architecture and sometimes it's good to be more dominant in it. Next. Um, this is just a small section on one of the other things that we've often found is using um, the idea of pitched roofs has, has been something that really helps to work about how we work with context. So context is always important in Britain. Um, it's something when you work abroad is less important, but in Britain it is incredibly important. This is one of our first buildings where we, we had a flat roof on it originally and it was going nowhere. The moment we put a pitched roof on it, the planners loved it, everyone enjoyed it and it sort of race through planning. Next. And we've done the same thing in, this is a little hospice in North London, in the, surrounded by all these semi detached houses. And again, it gives a lot of character. And if you go to the next one, it's good for a hospice because that's basically a pay, uh, place for people who have, uh, who need palliative care. This is for Kevin MacLeod in Oxford. It's housing, social housing, so pure affordable housing. And the, the little extra pitch, the sort of Hansel and Gretel pitch, is ready to get a four-bedroomed house in, and the other one's a three-bedroom. So in a way, it creates value, but creates distinction as well. 
and creates some sort of character next. Um, we often use this image when we're trying to create, put new buildings in context that is very sensitive. So how do you put a big building into a place where there's a high street that's that's been created over 300 years? And I think Amsterdam is great about variety. Next. So what we've done in this next project, which is Agam, which is where the Magna Carta was signed, um, we've created these apartment buildings, which is a huge building, but broken it into these smaller bays for each apartment with a pitched roof that steps from one smaller scale to a bigger scale. And straight away, this was another one of those ones where we had flat roofs. People absolutely hated it. We put pitched roofs on. It was bigger and they loved it. And it's sort of interesting. It's really made me question whether I'm getting softer in my old age or whether or not I've started to understand more about context. I think it's the latter. Next. And then a quirkier version is in Brentford, where we're creating a car park lined by housing, where you can see we've taken bits of Amsterdam. It's made out of crinkly tin, profile sheet metal in, in lots of quite vibrant colours. Next. So there's some of the things about how we construct ideas, and that's very important. Some of these are the earlier ones. This is Queen Victoria's bathing hut, and um, this next project is about a bathing hut and a barn. It was in Wiltshire. It was for Simon's mum and dad when we first started. It was uh, the one building we got before we got going. And next, if you can show it, it's called the pool house. That's why Queen Bathing, Queen Victoria's bathing hut's important. Half of it's a swimming pool, half of it's a two-bedroom flat, and you can see also the references to barns. Next, again on this one. Um, our project in the middle of the barking um, was on the site of the R. White's Lemonade factory. And um, if you go to the next slide, so what colour are we going to paint the balconies? Of course, we're going to paint them green and yellow. Reflect the history of that site, but in a very contemporary building. Next. And the leader of the council, of course, loved that story. I often use this in Liverpool. People think I'm joking, but it sort of worked. I did show it to the planners which was the idea, how do you put two things that are very different next to each other and make them look like they it means something next? So in a way, this, these odd, this odd couple is what our unity building um, is there. One of the rare moments there where it hasn't got scaffolding on, I'm afraid, um, but um, you can't blame us for that. Um, next, still an important building for us actually, because it had other layers to it. Tassel ships, as you know, were painted by artists in World War One and Two. Quite a lot of them in Liverpool. This is one of them next. So those patterns, if you can actually see the entrance to the office building, it's now been taken away and turned into something horrible, actually. But we originally it had these dazzle ship patterns that were real patterns just appropriated for the reception. Next. Um, in Westminster Academy, there are a few what I call one-liners, but they really worked. Hundreds and thousands in the fire escape staircases to make them something the kids would use more and make them, um, I suppose, having more character. Um, next, in the, uh, the assembly theatre, effectively a series of lightsabers on this concrete wall, which as you can see, the concrete was so terrible. What we needed to do was put some highlight in front of it so you didn't notice it, and then randomly locate these, these lightsabers across the wall with just a pink filter on a fluorescent, a cheap fluorescent light. That was a cheap trick. It took about two months to set out those lights to make them look random. Next. And Westminster Academy, and again, you've seen this image, but what are those panels above? Originally, they were going to be aluminium panels um, costing about £400 each, and we couldn't afford them. But we needed them to um, stop glare within the school classrooms. Next. So what I said to... Um, Balfour Beatty was, um, why don't we just buy doors and hang them? So that's actually what they are. They are doors for 40 quid rather than 400 quid, and they're just painted. Next, we did the same trick in Burntwood, where we took a bus stop off the peg because there needed to be a long canopy all the way through the middle, stretching about 300 metres. And we knew that we didn't have the budget for good steelwork. So what we did was took this bus stop, which I think was about £2,000 ago, doctored it, and then built it. So if you look at the next image, and of course, because it's a prefabricated off the peg element, it's much more elegant. And there you have the bus stops in this long linear route. Next. 
And in Liverpool again, you know, I used to go to St. Edward's Day here um, and uh, my head of music was the organist there, Philip Duffy. And um, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the bells there in the, the bell tower, I've always loved. So when it came to the Royal Court Theatre on the next slide, when it came to how do we hold up and create something for the digital sign, I will quote very directly from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, which is something that makes it very specific, to, I think, to Liverpool. Next. And then this is New Scotland Yard, one of the clearest drawings we ever did. It is not rocket science again. We are doing a new pavilion at the front, a pavilion on top, something at the back and something on the side. And we're up against big hitters like Foster's on this. But this drawing won the day because it was so clear what we were doing. And everyone else had sort of hidden it into, into other elements. But next, if you go to the next slide, there were other elements to this as well. Of course, um, you can see there the pavilion with Scotland Yard on the right. Um, and then behind that's where we're doing the new parliament. Next. But there are other little ideas. That drawing on the right was done really quickly the night before we handed in the competition because we we're trying to come up with lots of little vignettes. So the idea of leaving the lights on, the idea of the blue lamp, the idea of the police overlooking you 24 hours a day and feeling safe. Next. So that one sketch became a key part of the project. And of course, it's built in the end. And Sir Bernard Hogan Howe has had the police force loved it. Next. Another idea was our police car toilets, which um, everyone thought I was very strong on this in the competition and everyone thought, are you sure? And we had to present to Boris Johnson and Sir Bernard Hogan Howe. And I say, no, that this will win the day. It'll make them smile. And I said that, you know, I think people in the police enjoy cars. But as architects, we like the design of the cars and the liveries. So what we've got is on each floor, there's a different livery we've taken. This is the jam sandwich delivery. And that's on the tiling above the basin. So you get to the next one. You've got the um, the cars from the 70s, the Battenberg cake car. And it goes all the way through the periods. So you get something specific. And some of those little moments sometimes capture people's imagination. The final one here is the Secret Garden, which is about the older centre that we're creating. And this is something Susie in the office came up with, which is this book that I'm sure some of you know about um, a man whose wife died on the swing in a garden. He locked the garden forever because uh, the walled garden because he couldn't get over the fact his wife had died on the swing and hated the garden his cousin came over she was she was quite a difficult child she discovered the garden and slowly secretly made the garden beautiful again then brought him back in and both she became a better person and he began to be able to accept life moving on again and i suppose the older center in liverpool is all about bereavement and how you deal with bereavement. So it's such a great metaphor. So if you go to the next slide, you can see the idea of this walled garden and these pavilions that um, I suppose that surround the building. Yes, there you are. That's the cartoon that we did. So again, this this garden surrounded by walls with the gigantic older older Hay Hospital next to it, built on my road by the way, older road right next to where I lived. So it was always great to do this building. At the moment, we've got the buildings, but no walled garden. But we're hoping to get the walled garden in a few months' time. Next. <clears throat> OK, next. Can you flick through these while I'm talking, Sadi, if that's OK, just to get to the next section? So plan is really important to us. And I think it's an art form that has been lost. We have we spend a lot of time manicuring. If you stop on that one, plans. And I think it's something that the computer has not really helped us with. I think when you draw on the computer, you draw fragments, you don't look at the composition of the plan. But to me, that is absolutely vital. Um, this is Parliament, we see the chamber, and it took a long time to make that plan look very simple. And that plan has to deal with about six existing buildings, as well as our new elements. Next. So what do buildings look like next? We, we, I've got a few buildings here about how we actually look at buildings. So we do an awful lot of brick buildings. And that's sort of obviously something that's really important in the UK. Um, this is very simple, very gridded, all about detail, all about proportion, all about the texture of the brick. Next. This next one is um, in Croydon, where we're picking up on the Croydon vernacular, which is very much 1960s architecture. And probably the most ruthlessly repetitive building we've done. But these fantastic balconies south facing with great dual aspect apartments behind and this roof garden above. Next. 
sometimes it's really hard to be that simple. This is the idea of mixing brick with ceramic and colour. So we, because we quite enjoy colour. Next. And we've taken this on again in a much bigger building. That was about 20 years ago. This is an elephant castle where we've taken that idea of the much muted palette of colours, which is related to some of the ceramic buildings nearby this site. Next. Um, this is television centre, the back of it, where those studios are, that crescent, where we, because all the apartments are different, so the windows would be we would be in different locations. What we correct is these these plimsoll lines. So you get a brick which ties the balconies together, and then you get this dark zone where we can put windows wherever they are, and that means that you don't spoil the comp composition. I suppose a better way of looking at it, if that was brick windows within a brick facade, if we had different windows on different levels, it would be quite a chaotic facade. So that was a way of harnessing it next. But it's incredibly three dimensional when you're near it. So you get these huge cantilevering brick balconies. Next. And then brick further, looking at brick bonds next. This is a library we did in Wilson Green where we took the idea of brick bonds and the materials of local buildings next and created this very simple facade where the windows got smaller because it becomes an art gallery on the top floor. And you can see there the idea of brick bonds and how you can see the patterns within it. Next, we did this much more in another building where there it was deliberately abstract. Here it's deliberately trying to make the building more of a chameleon. It's the ray again, that stepped building. And what we've got is five different brick bonds and five different bricks. Next so that when you go up to the building, it gets lighter and it changes the bonds. This was absolutely trying to match and knit into the context. So these are the local buildings and this is us trying to get buildings that match it. Next, bricks that match it, sorry. And there's the building itself. So you can see this fantastic texture on this building um, and the way the light catches that brick, which is very important to us, and the way it gets slightly lighter towards the top. Next. Took a year to pick the bricks. Went through everything. And this is Parliament. All of the elements that are important to us about the elevation, including the three sided bays and the string courses that are in the Norman Shore buildings. Next, and this is the facade related to what's behind it, which, God forbid, is the MP's offices. Next, it's a funny old building to be designed at the moment, I'll tell you. And there's the outside of the building with those string courses, but in this case in London stock, because we think London stock is the brick of the people and red brick is different. And you can see elements of burnt wood at the bottom, but again, expressing each of those offices. Next. Concrete buildings, this is a, all built off site and is very refined. Next. Um, just flick through these, Sardia. This is a school in Dagenham where it's all off site. Another building we designed inspired by that sort of residence, housing embarking, designed a different way and stop there, and then Burntwood again, which is much more three dimensional and works from our point of view, um, creates a much more sculptural feel, but so that you, it's, you, it's quite rare to have this opportunity. Next. And then finally, I've got some metal buildings. So this is the Angel building where, where we were channeling our innermost Mies van der Rohe. Look at the level of detail on the corner of the building, really looking at how Mies did. We went on a whole study trip to Chicago, which yes, was good fun. and know the client didn't pay for. Um, next, we then looked, we've got a series of buildings coming out at the moment, which are more influenced by the, the Chicago School of Architecture in the 50s um, and the work of Skidmore Owens and Merrill. We think this, it's something that's been lost over time. So this is in Salford, and it takes the Golden Gate brick red, um, and th those overhangs create great solar protection to the windows. Next. And then more recently, the white collar, as well as all of the other things I've told you about, there's also an idea, and these are the wrong way around. The north face has more windows, and the south face has less windows. And that's to, to reduce solar gain. So each facade has a different proportion of windows because, and I think if there's one thing we're going to be doing more of in the future is looking at how we fight climate change and how that will affect the fabric of the buildings we design next. And this is one of our latest building for the, po it's called a post building. It's half the bottom is an existing post office and the top is housing. So as we go up, go to the next one. 
Um, next, please. Oh, Yang Gen's late. Missed all the, the big, the big um, moments. This is an idea. That sketch was an ideogram we showed the school about how you create this sort of ge ge geological facade. And this is the front elevation of Westminster Academy, where what we wanted was the outside to become the inside and the inside to become the outside. We also wanted it to fade in colour. Next. What colour were we going to pick? Well, it was actually in Westbourne Green, and we were taking down quite a lot of trees, so we thought green seemed appropriate. Next. And these were the colours, and the material became very important to the ceramic because of its reflective qualities and its depth. Next. And then here you can see the building, which is quite unusual when you ceramic. When it's in reflection, it looks very dark, almost black. And when you see it flat on, it's full colour. So you can see that idea that, I suppose, it's not really like a cliff edge anymore, but it's, it's, it's an idea that drives a scheme on. Next. The light boxes were where storage are, those yellow stripes. Again, looking front on. If we go to the next slide, the back elevation was the one we spent the least time on. We spent hours on that front one. And I, I was never, in the end, quite sure it was any good because it looked a bit too fussy. The back one is a series of fire escapes and terraces. And we just had four stripes, which are viewed from the west way. In a way, my touchstone was falling water. And it became the most successful elevation, the most dominant elevation. So it shows sometimes the harder you work, the worse it gets. Next. There are some other colour buildings. This is the back of Scotland Yard, where we've got this colourful facade next. And that colourful facade is based on all the materials of the surrounding buildings, taking their colour, sampling their colour, not their texture, and next, and then putting them together. Now, I make that sound quite simple, but picking those nine colours on the right, and I think, I think this is one of the most beautifully selection of colours we've done, actually. Sorry, I'm not trying to blow my trumpet, but I think they work well here. Um, took us a year and a half of small samples, bigger samples, real samples. Next. Keep flicking through here if you can, Sadia. Um, so I thought, could we create a whole building based on that, rather than just a little bit of the building? And this is all about how you select those color, keep going, and how many colors. The more colors you can get, the slightly different, the richer it can be. And this is a brand new building we're building in Broadgate. There it is, stop there, which is a huge building. And the color here breaks down the mass of that building. It's, and it's the only really colorful building that will be in the city. This is going on site later in the year. So it takes one small fragment of a building and extrudes it everywhere. Next. Yeah, so these are the final two quick bits. So next. So there, that shows you a little bit how we compose them. We can see the variety. These are about accents. So here, this is an artist um, intervention with us, the colors on the cheeks of that school. So it's just a small accent. Next. Um, this next one is you know the balconies being slightly colored. So the whole, you know, so moving away from full colour to accent colour. Next, I think in in um, Burntwood, you can see the portals as you come in were special colour, and every single block had a different colour that then went inside. Next, and then this new building we're doing, where which is on the old Cass School of Architecture, where we're building a whole building it's the same size above it. And so what we got is this gap, flash gap in between. And what I thought would be good was in the soffit of that flash gap, we create this fantastic piece of ceramic art where we're doing it with a, quite a new up and coming artist called Yinka, who was born not a mile away from this site. Next. The final bit I'm going to say, which is just a few slides, which is really, um, this is the, the hardest bit. So all of those are trying to create structures that allow people in our office design. How you tell 500 people to design with a similar ethos. This last bit's the um, you know the real moment. This is the how you you can compose things more by eye. And I, I taught for a long time with Peter Cook. Peter used to talk about students having a, an eye with that student. And what he meant was that they they, they could really design, and and that they. The students who couldn't put two lines together without making them look beautiful. Um, often in the office, I talk about how we're developing the scheme, and this is the moment where you can play the guitar solo. So next, 
So these are things where rules and rationale and grids don't work at all. So this is our pool house. So one of our first buildings, that square window on the right, there must have been about 40 options for it and trying to get it just right was important to us. Next, it's a big bay window. If I look at this building, you know, it seems rather simple, but if you look at the, the pattern of fenestration where the millions are, they, they vary everywhere. And it became one of our early obsessions about not trying to line things up always, trying to let them be what they are inside. And that, so I could tell you why every single vertical line, horizontal line occurs in that facade. Next. Um, very simple idea of just sliding and the idea of the detail there that just shifts that from being a building that could be quite banal into something that is more dynamic. Next. Again, that school with the intervention of the artist, this is just, you know, shifting that massive canopy so it's asymmetrical and then looking at this composition of walls in front of it. And I suppose how one needs to have an idea about what you're trying to create there. So I always remember doing a sketch of this and how things slid and moved around and trying to make it asymmetrical, not symmetrical, because asymmetrical felt better for a primary school. Next. Well, it's a very grand looking primary school. Embarking, I think we went through quite, I'd, I'd just had lunch with Will also, and I was quite drunk, as was normally the way when you have lunch with Will. And he told us, you've really got to start going for it. This was about 15 years. You've got to go start going for it now, because you've built more than we have. And so I remember going back saying, Will's got to really, tell us to really go for it. And we were doing barking, and we did this mad sliding elevation at the end. Definitely our most exuberant facade. But there is a story there about, the idea of those balconies almost being like Jenga blocks, the idea of that giant public room. And effectively, the, the windows on the right are all about natural ventilation. Some of them open, some of them don't. And um, yeah, it's one of the more enjoyable facades. Next. And then getting back to slightly quieter moments, this is also embarking, where we were trying to build a new brick tower when they were knocking them down everywhere. So the only thing I could think of was trying to slide the elevation, so join the balconies together, give a triple height and make that break down the scale of the building and then employ colour within that. Next. And then in Kentish Town Health Centre, it's very rational, it's offices or doctor's rooms, but there is an idea, offices were wide windows, doctor's rooms were, were small windows and we checkerboarded them on the facade, so sometimes the windows went around the corner and sometimes they didn't. And that set of rules created a randomness and a compositional technique that worked for the whole building. Next. Which you were able to just tell someone and they could translate it. And then Burnwood were effectively, the, there's only four panels there, but by twisting them around, you got them moving in the facade. And um, yeah. And here you can see in a, um, you know, although I've told you that in a way that T-shaped window is about an expression of the section. All of those elements on that facade are very knowingly located. It's not just someone who's literally blandly following through the plan. The choice of where those windows on the right go, the choice of making the, the office window at the bottom slightly taller, are all choices that someone's made and someone's had a bigger picture about this, this facade. Next. <clears throat> In, in North Croydon, oh yeah, this is a new, a new school, we've done a primary school in Camden. But again, those windows could be located wherever you wanted because they were offices or, or smaller rooms where we didn't need to have too many windows. So again, they're quite knowingly located. And then the final one is effectively North Croydon Medical Centre where there was an idea there that, which is for people who are dying and it's to try and help them. Um, doing art classes and take their mind off things. But there were different rooms. Every single room has a different set of windows in related to what's going on inside. And that created this, um, I suppose, this randomness within the facade within these very strong pitched roof forms. So as I get to the end of that, next, Sadia, um, I suppose what I asked myself when I was putting this together was um, how incredibly exhausting it's been trying to come up with new ideas for new projects and why the hell do we do it? And I suppose I then go back to our founder statement and it's because we love architecture, that we love working with people and we're bloody ambitious and that's why we do it. 
but I sometimes wish we just picked a house style 30 years ago and stuck to it to the next 30 years, but maybe I don't really. Thank you very much indeed. Sorry I went a bit further, but thank you. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, as stated earlier, um, he's very, Paul has very kindly agreed to answer some questions. Um, so what I'll do is I'll ask for, for, for yourselves to um, either send something into chat um, or, or, or raise your hand virtually if we can, hope we, hope we can see it and answer it. What I will, what I will um, start with was a question asked yesterday uh, ahead of the game. So first in, first answer. Uh, from from Goka at Luntas, um, who's a BIM student, um, and and Goka's interested, Paul, to know um, if there are BIM opportunities in AHM and, and and practices like yourselves, and and do these help the creative process? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's always opportunities for all architects in our office and BIM coordinators and BIM users. BIM's almost taken over all the projects we do now, so we use Revit. Um, and BIM is an incredible, you know, I think it's something that's we're all developing. I think because we probably have 70% of the office who can use it now, and it is quite a powerful tool and quite complicated, particularly if you're younger and not so experienced. Um, but once you do know how to use it, it can be incredibly powerful. And um, I think from our point of view, we're starting to learn to do things beyond working drawings. We're starting to do good presentation drawings with them, but it takes real skill. But no, it's 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 probably I would imagine in within the next five years, there won't be anything else other than BIM, even for house extensions. So if you don't know how to use it, you're going to be last in the pile for getting interviewed. So I think it, it's a hard thing to lose, but I think the quicker you get onto it, the better. And, and you're at the perfect age, all of you here. But yes, there are always opportunities for BIM people in our office, and we're always looking for them. That's great. Thank, thank you, Paul. Um, there's one from David Grant here from third year. He, he's he, he's uh, very impressed with the drawings, and, and quite naturally, and um, has asked what role physical model making plays in, in, in your office. Do you, do you make models to develop ideas, to sell ideas, um, and do you employ students who have model physical model making skills? Yeah, OK, sorry, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, totally. And I haven't got any models in here, um, but we do use we have 15 people who work in the model shop full time. We got I think we are the biggest model shop in London. Um, we don't have any architects who do it. The architects work with the model shop. What we found is architects quite like doing it for a bit and then um, don't. After a while, they want to run projects. So, whereas model, model makers are trained to be model makers. So we do phenomenal models in the office. The whole of our office is an exhibition of models and every project gets models made, um, whether it be 3D printing, where we're very good at that, the different scales of 3D printing, timber models, perspex models, some cardboard models. But what we tend to find, to be honest, the, the level we work at, people who are younger making models who are architects they just can't get to the level that we need to for the sort of money clients are spending in our buildings so there can be 